Hello everybody, it's Dr. Rick. Um, yeah. But um, I guess the back end of my day, I'm not done yet, but I'm taking a break. I'm going to sit down and uh, politic with the guys for a while. But uh, I need to talk to you about something that was on my mind, something that I am extremely passionate about something that you have heard me talk about uh, for years, literally. Uh, if one thing I am, I'm consistent with my message because I'm consistent with my intent. The only way that my message changes is that if new information arises that convinces me that the initial stance I took was incorrect. But if I have uh, an incessant amount of an incessant flow and a volumetric amount of empirical data that backs me up on something I'm going to stand with it, I'm going to roll with it and I'll fall with it but I will not bend the truth to make people happy that's one of the reasons you don't see the subscribership blowing up on my page despite literally thousands upon thousands of articles of truth, uh, information, uh, strategies, plans that everybody seems to think is exceptional, but the, it doesn't grow because I tell the truth. I'm not here to entertain you. I'm not here to win your vote. Uh, I'm not here to become popular. I'm not here for any of those things that other people do because they understand that if they work it right, money's tied to it. Um, I'm not here for money. I earn a living. I run businesses. Um, you know, would I be? Would I like to be able to raise more money to support the work I do? so it doesn't weigh so heavily on me absolutely but that doesn't happen and i keep going i've done it for years so obviously i'm committed to this game because this game does not pay me at all so that allows me also to speak the truth i have absolutely nothing to lose so uh one of the things that i've always been really really truly um given to and speaking of giving if you want to give the information is in the description box i'm not going to go through all that today if you if you really truly believe in what i'm doing do what you think you should do to support the work i do so that people like me do are able to continue to do what we do but here here's what i want to talk about i've been talking about for years the feminization of the black male image i'm going to talk about that and i'm going to talk about this nikki holtz nikki hilts character who won the ladies 1500 meters for the usa uh nationals track and field championships to see who goes to the worlds uh she beat a uh, world-class athlete i think uh Mo. and i'm saying she because she dreamt she tra she identifies as um transgender non-binary so she's neither but she identifies, she, so she identifies, and I'm going to touch on why that, you know, I have a problem with that since she is biologically a female, why I still have a problem with the way that it's being played in the media. But I'm going to start off with this whole feminization of the black, uh, black male image. Let me tell you something. We can talk about what athletes and entertainers are and are not all day. We can sit up and say they are not, um, we can sit up and say all day that they are not uh, role models. We can sit up and say they are not the standard that we need to be, uh, uh, that we need to be setting for our kids. And the truth of the matter is, they should not be. And they, and, but the bottom line is, the media has created platforms for them. The media has heaped praise on them. So, in essence, they have become uh, de facto. Uh, role models whether you like it or not whether they like it or not they are going to be looked upon as a standard they're going to be looked upon as a model of behavior they're going to be looked upon as something to aspire to and this is one of the reasons that the powers that be have used the fashion industry as a means to feminize that black male image to literally sip or seep are drain the masculinity from black males many of which i believe are actually heterosexual but are presenting themselves in highly emasculine ways because 
they think it's fashion sensible that it speaks to their extraordinary fashion sense that they are willing to step outside of the box you don't step outside of the box of masculinity masculinity is something you should own from day one and when i say masculinity don't don't i don't i want to know this bull crap about toxic masculinity i've already given my my lecture on that my speech on that i've written on that and everything else there's no such thing as toxic masculinity there's toxic behavior that they love to ascribe to masculinity especially when it comes to a black man why there's an assault on masculinity so the more negative ideologies and ideas we can and monikers we can attach to masculinity the more people will hate it the more people will despise it the more people will look down on it before you know it anything that is reflective of true masculinity will be hated and despised in this world for the sake of what reducing the ability of black men to stand up and do what they are built to do the most and no it's not provide it's protect the most primitive of all characteristics of masculinity is protection before provision, provision is immensely important. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to marginalize it, but the most important thing is to cover, to literally be a physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual covering for all who are underneath his covering. He is to provide an environment that allows those he protects and covers to thrive, to grow, to become stronger, to become more forceful. And it, be and it begins with his woman. But when you rob him of it, when you tell him it's not necessary, the more feminine he behaves, the less respected he is. Now here's the thing that really gets you. There's nothing a man thrives and thrives for and, and, and desires more than respect. You can say love, men like being loved, we wanna be loved, but not as much as we need to be respected. Respect is the reason most violent crimes are committed by men. The feeling of being disrespected. And this isn't me speaking outside of my tongue. This is me with years, decades of research. I'm not the only one respected people like Dr. Howard Stevenson out of the University of Pennsylvania. Respected uh, people like uh, uh, professor at uh, University of Portland, Dr. Joy DeGroote have done years and years of work that took it up and talk about the power and the force of respect. It's the number one driving factor in African-American adolescent violence. Now, the second most prevalent is the lack of proper racial socialization, which again, something I've been uh, presenting and teaching on and uh, uh, parroting and championing for decades. And it's the reason why I created the Black Man Lead Rite of Passage Initiative, which is a rite of passage which socializes young black males into black manhood. It is immensely important, why? Because it reduces violence, it reduces the proclivity for criminality, which reduces the chances, it also reduces the chance of dropping out of uh, school and not getting a diploma, which reduces the chance of becoming incarcerated, increasing the chance of earning a livable wage that's capable of supporting a family, which brings in the second level of inherent masculinity, provision. You can't talk about provision before talking about protection. You can't talk about either before talking about socialization, but we have a problem. When I looked at this cat, seven foot tall NBA player, um, godly, uh, drawing a blank, but the picture's floating around it. Uh, I'm uh, pretty sure that at some point I'm going to make it my thumbnail on this video, but uh, Ryan Turner or something like that, but he plays with any under patients, seven foot tall, last name Turner. Um, but the femininity presented at this guy sitting on court side doing summer league play is absolutely ridiculous from the way he's dressed to the way he's sitting to the way he's presenting himself. And he's not the only one. We see it consistently with the way these these players are dressing. If you didn't know, I and here's the crazy thing, and and and, and you know who knows? I'm probably gonna get stormed, and shoot, this might be it. Channel might whatever, but I tell you what. They take this when I'm done I'm up because the work it takes to build this thing back up just to sit up and have people not really get behind you in the first place. It's not worth it.
but I'm gonna speak my truth and, and, and I'll let the chips fall where they may. Let me tell you something. They show NBA players coming to the game and how they're, what they're dressed in and all that. The, you know, it's a new fashion walk, fashion statement thing. And I get it, I get it, you know. Uh, it's a part of the brand now. But they do it also for the women, the WNBA. And what I can tell you is it's confusing as hell. Why? Because there are some of the women that are more masculine than the men walking in. And that can be looked at it both ways. There are some very masculine women in the WNBA. Um, and there's some very feminine dressing black males who are very talented and obviously very athletic and uh, can play well enough to be paid millions of dollars to do so. But that idea of celebrity praise, uh, praising athletes puts them in a situation where our children are looking at them as what to aspire to be. The problem is it is immensely difficult, next to impossible, to lead from a position in which your masculinity isn't amply displayed. And once again, I'm going to say this, toxic masculinity does not exist. Toxic behavior is not the same <coughs> as masculinity. <coughs> and we have to gain an understanding of that so that we can speak on it from an educated perspective. So when we sit up and talk about this, masculinity is by its very nature provisional, protective, inspiring. A man inspires those under his covering. He encourages those under his covering. He protects those under his covering. He provides for those under his covering. And that's the nature of masculinity. Those things. If it's not those things, then it's not masculine. Just because a man does it, doesn't make it masculine. Just because it's aggressive, doesn't make it masculine. We, we have gotten to a point where the assault on masculinity has redefined it and labeled it with things that don't uh, align with the true nature of it and then we're buying in on it. So now it's actually being used against men. Masculinity is being used against men. How? The moment that a man does something, even if it's within the confines of true masculinity, but doesn't align with what somebody wants, they are immediately accused of toxic masculinity. So then what happens? It's this forceful way of putting a man in his place and making him docile, making him conform, making him compliant to what we want versus allowing him to lead and standing the true nature of who he is so that he defends the things that are truly precious. We are losing ourselves trying to conform to something that does not serve our values, our interests, our principles. And we are actually becoming not only compliant, but participatory in the breaking of the black man. This isn't me blaming black women at all. This is me saying we in totality are trying to force our men to align with a behavior that does not serve us. It serves them well, but it doesn't serve us. We need radical black men. We need black men willing to die. It was Dr. King during the time of his life that I actually uh, am very infatuated with. The first part of his life was, you know, the thing that all little black kids were taught growing up, you know, the I have a dream and the integration and all that. I, I prefer the one at the end that wanted to check. Nobody talks about that dude. Nobody talks about the dude that said, hey, if you don't have something for which you are willing to die, you're not fit to live. Nobody talks about that dude. Nobody talks about the dude that was saying it's time to hand, me a, hand us our money. We come in the cash. And Nobody talks about that dude. But, but, but he said that if a man doesn't have something for which he is willing to die, he's not fit to live. See, what it is is any man that's willing to die for something is crazy. That's how it's put. Stupid. 
there's no need for violence. Oh, there's absolutely a need for violence. A black man, any man, needs to have the capacity to become violent when necessary. He not only needs to have the capacity to become violent, he needs to have the natural aggression within him that when it's necessary, he does it. But he needs to understand what that need is. It's not some block that you don't own fighting over that. It's not going back and forth with your brother over some woman that's playing the both of you. It's not sitting up trying to prove you're better than your brother. It's sitting up and saying, we're going to protect blackness in every aspect, starting with the black woman starting with black children and we're going to protect every element and component we're going to start with the neighborhood we're going to start with the community we're going to protect it with our lives and this is where we start to grow but we've got to develop and build that but what we cannot do is sit up and sit silent while they present to us an emasculated feminized image of ourselves and say this is what we want from you and everybody be okay with it clapping and applauding it hell no now Real briefly on this Nikki Hiltz thing, this, and the thing is, I was really hot when I first heard it because when you hear normally hear non-binary transgender running and competing in female sports, it's normally a former biological male. This person was born a female, but she classifies as non-binary. Now, let me tell you why it's still a problem because she's going to cloud the the the. Uh, uh, she's going to cloud the water. She's going to make it uh, more difficult to make the argument. Why? Because she's claiming non-binary, but she's operating and competing in a field where she is literally still within the, the confines of guidelines of what would normally be expected. She is a biological female competing against, competing against biological female. She just doesn't want to be referred to as a female. So what you do is when you read this article about this, because she competed against Athing Moo, which is uh, the world's best 800 meter runner. She's also been competing and doing well in the 1500 meters. And when I first heard that she had beat at the Moo and it was dominated I was thinking okay this is another male doing whatever and I'm thinking it's the 800 but it was the 1500 uh, and this person has actually been pretty dominant in the 1500 but uh, here's what happens when you're reading the thing it's confusing as hell because it says when they when they turned on the stretch not she but when they turned on the stretch they accelerated so you're thinking okay it's two of them when they're going they said when they lined up you know, that was a flag out there and they took it as and they and they and they and I'm like, they, who is the other person? And then I realized this, this new pronoun, pronoun stuff, you know, it's no more he or she, it's they. And so you can't refer to them as he or she because they're non-binary. They are neither. So you have to say they, they as in most of the time is plural, you know, you know, they, them, plural. And so, here's this thing, you're trying to figure this out, but, you know, despite, despite, you know, besides the obvious confusion, here's the thing. So now, because you've got someone saying they're non-binary, but they're operating inside of their own actual biological assignment, you know, everybody's gonna say, okay, it is what it is, and it is. And let me clarify something because this never freaking fails. Anytime you call out people from the alphabet community, they start throwing the phobias around looking at it. As a mental health professional, as a person who makes a living in this area, nobody's got a phobia. A phobia is an irrational fear of something. I don't fear anybody. I don't fear your lifestyle. I don't fear anything, but I have a right to disagree with it. Disagreeing with somebody does not make you a phobic. It does not make you hateful. It simply says I disagree. Whenever somebody is literally trying to socially, politically, financially force you to agree with an opinion, don't agree with it, it's bullying. And it's absolutely unacceptable. You can kiss my ass because I'm not going to do it. I'm going to call what I believe what I believe and I'm going to do it in love because I have people in that community that are a part of my family, close parts of my family that I love dearly and I treat them the same as I treat anybody else and I'll do the same with anybody else. 
you know, when you bring things that's supposed to be a part of your private life on Front Street in the first place, you're asking for a lot. And there are a bunch of people within that community who are overtly and blaringly gay who disagree with what's being done. Not the right to be who you want to be, but in the way that it's done. You're talking about uh, pride parades where you got people running around nude with their private area showing and little kids there. You got them doing all kind of sex acts, little kids there. You got, And this is a part of this other part of the problem where we are now starting to normalize pedophilia and ephebophilia. And it's absolutely unacceptable. And it's the normalization process. If you don't know what a normalization process is, it's the subtle movement towards uh, a certain or des designated desired social state uh, in such incremental and uh, subtle movements that it's not overtly offensive. And people look at it and go, uh, but don't take the time to address it or challenge it and so before you know it they've moved the line and then you're looking up and things you didn't allow 10 years ago are common now because you didn't stand your ground and standing your ground does not mean attacking anybody standing your ground does not mean personally or physically harming somebody or trying to destroy somebody it's simply being able to say and speak your truth and move on it the way that you believe is going to be effective without being harmful. We are not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not in any way suggesting anybody harm anybody unless somebody harms you. And that way it doesn't matter who it is. If you try to harm me or mine, I'm going to do everything that I can to end it. I'm, I'm not playing halfway with nobody anymore at this point in my life. I'm not trying to do anything. You stay out of my space, you'll never have a problem with me. You leave my people alone, you'll never have a problem with me. If you mess with what I am uh, uh, assigned to protect, I'm going to do everything I can to end it. It's that simple. But this is the thing here. We have a responsibility as a community to look at what works and is effective and aligns with our characteristics and our our uh, values, our interests, our principles and determine within that what we want to champion, what we want to resist, what we want to all out uh, push back on. And we need to do it unapologetically. We have got to take more aggressive action towards these things. On that note, look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. But I had to stop in and talk about that. And like I said, this isn't new. Anybody's following me. This has been my stand from day one. Uh, I'm not here to tell you how to live your life, but you can't force me to receive it in a way that impairs or uh, impairs upon what I want to do and how I want to live because I'm not going to do that to you. And so you're, you're not going to do it to me. Um, and that is that. To everybody, peace. Love, I'm out of here. Talk to you soon.